Welcome to The Meetings Podcast, the meeting organizer's podcast source for what's new in the meetings and events industry. Meetings Podcast is a conversation with a variety of voices that looks at events, meetings, and media. Meetings Podcast is sponsored by IMAX America, America's worldwide exhibition for incentive travel, meetings, and events. Hey, podcast listeners, this is Mike. Today's show is brought to you by IMAX America. We'd also like to thank AV4Planners.com. Full disclosure, I am an investor and founder at AV4Planners, uh, but here's how AV4Planners works. AV4Planners takes your upcoming meeting or conference three AV bids or proposals and gives you an easy-to-read, one-page evaluation you need to negotiate to make sure you have the correct equipment and pricing and labor for your conference audiovisual. Um, behind that one page is... Um, supporting materials that are easy to read for your reference. So if, you, you, if you're going through your one pager and you have a question, you can go back to the reference material and see exactly why we made that choice or the, that um, decision. Um, if you're still unhappy with the evaluation, AV for Planners can bring in a fourth AV company and try to get you a better price. So check out avforplanners.com for more information to get the best pricing for audiovisual and uh, the confidence you are getting the right equipment and labor for any size meeting or event. So let's get into today's today's show. Today's show, we have Tyra Hilliard. Uh, Tyra is awesome. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking with her. And let's get right into the interview, and I will check back with you at the end of the show. So I appreciate you listening, and I will uh, I'll talk to you in a little bit. Welcome back to the Meetings Podcast. This is Mike McAllen from Grass Shack Events and Media. And on today's show, we have Tyra Hilliard. Hi, Tyra. Hi, Mike. How are you? <laughs> nice to uh, nice to have you on the show. It's good to talk to you. Um, I'm going to read a quick little bio that you sent over. Uh, you speak and teach about law and risk in the meetings and hospitality industries. You've worked in the meetings industry as an attorney, a meeting planner, a catering manager, and an association executive. You are one of only two people in the world with a PhD in hospitality, a law degree, and a CMP. Who is the Correct. other person? Correct. Who, who's, so who's the other person? So you know I'm really annoyed with her, right? The other person? And she's younger and skinnier. So uh, her name is Jayana Abbott. She teaches at University of Houston. Oh, really? How funny. Yeah. And how do you know you're the only two people? Well, we're not positive, but we have never been able to find anybody else that has done the law and the PhD in hospitality. So we have we have combed through all of the hospitality programs, and um, we haven't found – when we have found somebody who has the law and hospitality, they don't have the CMP. Ah. So it's a, uh, it's a weird trifecta for somebody to do, and only us strange overachievers seem to, uh, <laughs> to go for all three. <laughs> Only so, Jayana also runs like you know triathlons and things. Oh so, my gosh. You know, wow. She yeah. is an She's a real overachiever. Yeah. So you, you uh, when you okay. So first, let me ask you. Uh, give me your favorite quote because that's how we start out all of these nowadays, these podcasts, and then we'll get in. I have, of course, that your your bio just brought up a thousand more questions, and I only sent you a few questions. So <laughs> okay, um, you know, my favorite quote is from Thomas Jefferson. It's, I'm a great believer in luck, and I find the harder I work, the more I have of it. And nice. Very nice. Yeah. Because um, I've always felt very lucky, you know? I've always felt like, wow, this stuff happens to me. And my husband occasionally says, yeah, you work really hard, but it doesn't feel like work, so it just feels like luck. That's great. That's a great one. So how um, so how did this whole path of the PhD in hospitality the law degree what, which came first and how did that how did you get into this whole your whole um, <laughs> take me from the, your career path how you got to where you are now well you know it it, it really started off I, I guess it's a really organic thing for me because I grew up in a tourist area um, actually where I'm living now um, St Simon's Island Georgia it's it's a very touristy area so I grew up working in restaurants you know, helping guests find hotels and that kind of thing and restaurants and activities and uh, attractions and all of that was just sort of second nature when you live in a tourist town, um, as is complaining about the tourists in the summer, but being really grateful for their money. Um, So when I I went to college in Washington, D.C., and so it was very natural for me to go get a job 
in a hotel. Uh, it felt very comfortable, and it was actually my favorite part of college. I worked for the Keybridge Marriott in Roslyn, Virginia, during college, and um, it, it was just it was great. And then after college, and this sort of dates me a little bit. I was looking through the Washington Post, and I mean the print Washington Post for jobs, because that's what we did back then, <laughs> and <laughs> and I actually saw a job listing that said, it said, you know, some stuff I didn't really understand, and then it said, hotel experience helpful and travel required, and I thought, okay, I've worked in a hotel now for like four years, and I want to travel because I'm young and single, I've just graduated from college, and it turned out to be my first meeting planning job. Uh, but I, you know, like most people back then, I didn't know that meeting planning was even a, a thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't know certainly that it could be a career. So I had, I took that job and then I heard about a master's in tourism program. So I got my master's in tourism, which you'll find is a theme with me. I go back to school regularly and I did that for a while. Then I felt like since I had a master's degree, I needed to try something a little different. So I went to work for Convention and Visitors Bureau up in Waukesha, Wisconsin, which didn't last very long because I'm from the deep south and it's cold in Wisconsin, (laughs) really cold, even in July. So that didn't last too long for me. Plus, I discovered that I am not a salesperson. So CVB sales was not a good fit for me. So I came back home to St. Simons Island and I spent some time in Atlanta as a at a another job as a meeting planner, um, ended up in catering sales uh, for a hotel down here in Georgia and um, was, you know, flipping through the magazines and doing catering, working with clients. I mean, anytime you're working with food, it's good. It's good stuff. Um, and the event planning side of thing came, you know, second nature by then. And I, as I was looking through the meetings magazines, it, it occurred to me, I was trying to figure out what to do next because I'm always a what comes next kind of person. And you know, one thing I realized is that the clients that came in, one of the things they had the hardest time with were the contracts, understanding them, signing them, negotiating them. And the other thing I realized in looking through the meetings magazines, um, and you'll forgive my non-PC uh, comment here, but all the legal articles were written by old white guys. And and by old white guys, and, and I hope John Foster and John Howe aren't listening to this, I mean those guys. Um <laughs> Because they were the only two kind of out there at the time. And so I thought, wow, being a lawyer would be a really good place for a woman right now, Um, you know, in this industry and having experience as a planner and as a hotel caterer. So I went to law school um, in Kansas, of all places, because I got a scholarship um, and ended up finishing law school in Atlanta and working for John Foster. So he gave me my start in the legal field, and I'm very grateful to him for that. And um, worked for another law firm in Atlanta, and then I had a chance to teach a class um, at Georgia State University in their hospitality program, and then I was really hooked on teaching. And so I went and taught at George Washington University, and everybody kept telling me, you know, that law degree is basically worthless. You know, you can't be a faculty member unless you have a PhD. Um, So I went and got my PhD. Because that's, again, what I do. <laughs> so I got my PhD, and so now I am, I am credentialed up to the eyeballs, and I still can't figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> well, you're a very good speaker. I saw you speak somewhere. I'm trying to think at one of these things, and you talked about introverts, and I found it very interesting. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, it was a really good session, and, um, and I'm, kind of, I'm kind of an introvert in a way. Um, how was it? How did you explain that? It was like, it was people who, because I'm good in like small groups, like I can move through a crowd, but in speaking in front of people, I think you and I are the opposites. I think we are. Yeah, I because I'm good just- at like just networking. I can walk up to anybody, but when I have to speak in front of a large group of people, like it freaks me out, and then I, I can't, I'm not very good at that. Yeah, a lot of people are are afraid of public speaking, and you know, I I, I don't understand. Why exactly? But you know, I'm a I'm a social introvert. I I like people. I like going to social functions, but I sort of need a wingman. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, for a long time, I've had a conference husband that you know I I always try to make sure we go to the same conferences so he can walk around with me. 
um, cause he's an extrovert. So he's the social butterfly. And then I have somebody to sort of cling to, but I can stand in front of a, a huge group and, and talk no problem. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. So we are, we're the exact opposite. How funny, how funny. So what's the biggest challenge been, uh, besides, um, going to school so much? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I love school, so I don't even consider that. And we're opposites there, too. I consider that a benefit. That's uh, just something fun I get to do. That's you great. know, honestly, I think I'm my own biggest challenge. I, um, you know, I've never been a, a business plan person. I've, I've never been – I'm not a very good marketing person. Um, so some of it has just been sort of trusting in myself to take the leap to do what, whatever the next thing is. Um, so I think that's been one of my biggest challenges, that and the fact that I have this – and you may have seen uh, – you know, it runs around Facebook periodically. There's a, a meme that talks about, you know, I, I love chaos, you know, un, un, until I you know, crave routine and mm-hmm. until I need chaos again and, mm-hmm. and then I want routine. And, and that's me. I mean that is so me. Um, and so it sort of drives my husband crazy, um, and and it does make my life a little tough. And and so you know, over the last few years, what that's looked like is I'm going to teach for a while. No, I need to travel and speak and do this and that and the other. And oh no, and we need to move again. And um, you know, so I think that's probably one of my bigger challenges. How funny! And do you mind me asking what your husband do? He works for a government contractor up in the D.C. area. He does uh, IT research. Oh. Uh. Does he travel a lot then, or is he? Not a lot, actually. He goes up to D.C. two or three times a year. Very cool. Um, must be a good guy. He's uh, a great guy. Yeah. Um, so tell me when – did was there like an aha moment um, that you knew now that you'd made the right direct, you know, the right decision to get into this career of this crazy world of events and meetings? <laughs> is there like one moment that you were like, oh, yeah – well, you know, I've I've had so many different aspects of the meetings industry. Um, sometimes it's sort of hard to pick, but I think as far as going out on my own and and doing my own thing, you know, I can remember being at a at a conference, and I I think it was like a probably destination showcase. It wasn't it wasn't a huge conference, or at least it wasn't a huge session that I was speaking in. But I remember I was speaking, and I think it was on, on contracts or, or legal issues, and there was just this really good discussion going with everybody, and you know we were just really going, and afterwards people were saying, hey, thanks, that was really helpful. And I just remember standing there and going, you know, it's cliche, but wow, they're going to pay me to do this? That's like, great. this is just... You know, it was so awesome, and I realized that sort of everything I had done had just come together. You know, all of the the job hopping. You know, all the times my father rolled his eyes, going, "Oh, what are you doing now?" <laughs> you know, it was it all came together? It's all helpful. You know, it's all pertinent now. That's and so, so cool. that was that was pretty cool feeling. Yeah, that's great. That's that's good to hear. You know, it's it's funny. I ask that question to everybody, and a lot of people are like, "Well, it hasn't happened yet." <laughs> uh- <laughs> <laughs> but I was waiting for you. That was great. Okay, so uh, why don't you tell us basically what you do, and do you have something right now, some project you're working on or something? Um, you, you're welcome to share that now too, but uh, tell us really what you do. If someone wanted to, say, work with you, what, how would they do that? And take us through that. Sure. Well, you know, I, I think the question I dread the most at like a cocktail party is, so what do you do? Because it, it, I just don't have a good, you know, elevator speech for that. Even mm-hmm. though I teach my students how to do an elevator speech, I don't have one. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh, I, and sometimes I literally say, you know, whatever somebody will pay me to do. That's that's what I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. But, but you know, the the bulk of my, you know, the bulk of my business these days is speaking. Um, is is speaking at conferences. Um, and mostly on legal issues and, and risk management, crisis preparedness for meetings and events. And that's, you know, that's my real heart um, are those two issues. And so I just love speaking and, and traveling. I enjoy the travel um, and I enjoy sharing the education and the knowledge and, and hearing people's stories and, and also just facilitating the sharing of knowledge because I find people have a lot of knowledge already and they just need an excuse to share it with each other. So it's not so much me coming in on my white horse and saving the day. It's more 
opening up the opportunity for everybody to share their knowledge because mm-hmm. there's always a vast amount of knowledge in the room. Um, so that's that's probably the biggest part of what I do. I've been doing a lot more in-house training um, than I have done in the past where I think people are, are really wanting some in-depth uh, team training. So I uh, actually worked – I've worked with a few groups on in-house emergency uh, preparedness training – so helping them write their crisis plans or helping them just go through their own unique processes, whether they use RFPs, the number of meetings they have, um, you know, doing a, a threat assessment and hazard assessment with them so that we can figure out what they should be worried about. And, you know, so they're, they're focusing their concerns and they're planning on the right things and providing them resources to, to help them manage those things. Because I, I really focus on the preparedness side, not the response side, but I have colleagues who, who help. If something happens, then I'm like, call Bob. You know, I'm not your person. If something right. happens, call Bob. Right. He's the guy. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that, uh, and then I do also still teach college classes, which um, I'm truly passionate about. Um, those those students keep me young, um, and they also keep me on my toes. So I do love my college teaching, um, and I you know I truly do get odds and ends that come in just just different things that people call and say, do you do this? And sometimes I say, no, that's not really in my my wheelhouse. And other times I go, well, I haven't, but I can. And I love those opportunities. And that's sort of what I love about being an entrepreneur. That's very cool. And is it hard to balance the traveling with the stu- with the school uh, teaching? I mean, you know, it students? is. It's a, it is. It's a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, I always joke with my students, gee, I'm, I'm really sorry I have to cancel another class. And they're like, yeah, we hate that, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I bet they do, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I have talked to, like, the dean at the college that I, I teach at. And, you know, he said, you know, I think it's really good for the college that you're out there, that you're speaking um, and he said, you know, I think it keeps you current, it gets you out there, and um, he said, I think it's good for the students and good for the college, so he's been very supportive, but, you know, it is. I think, you know, travel is challenging because it's, um, and I'm always trying to find that right balance, you know, what's best for the balance of jobs for the students, for the college, for my family, um, you know, I think that's a constant sort of struggle. Yeah, are you, you must be close to an airport then. <laughs> I mean, are you? I, I don't know where Saint Saint Simon is. That what you say? You're Saint Simon's Island. Yeah, we're oh. uh, just south of Savannah, just north of Jacksonville, Florida. Oh. So it's um, it, we have a tiny little airport here. Brunswick is the airport, and mm-hmm. it has four flights a day to Atlanta. Ah. So it is uh, not much of one. I, I am a loyal Delta flyer because that's the only airline that flies out of there. But. Oh, um, yeah, it's uh, it's limited, but it's it, and in push comes to shove. Sometimes when I have to go out to the West Coast, I will fly out of Jacksonville, Florida. It's about a an hour and a half drive from here, so I can always do that if I really need to. Mm, very cool. Okay, so um, where do you see yourself in the future? What uh, degree are you going to get next? And, uh, <laughs> I don't know. My husband is has is, is would like to forbid me from going back to school. Uh, <laughs> You know, I actually considered going for EMT training. Um, I thought that would be really interesting to do, but um, I'm not sure I will actually do that. I, you know, I don't know that there will be more school in my future. I, I'm so busy with uh, helping my son with his school. I'm not sure I have the energy to do my own school anymore. Um, if anything, I think maybe I might want to rebalance what I'm doing and maybe teach a little a little more mm-hmm. um, you know I'm only doing one or two classes a semester right now and and I really miss being with the students more and being able to to form a relationship with them so I imagine the future will hold probably more teaching and I'd really like to do more writing um, that's something that I'd, I'd like to do I uh, Nancy Zavada every time I see her keeps saying when are you going to write that book so I have to be careful to avoid Nancy now <laughs> <laughs> until until I at least get a, an outline of my book, uh, but but you know I have thought for a long time that the industry needs needs some fairly simple books, not simple but some fairly straightforward yeah. non legalese 
resources for contracts and for legal issues that you know are not so technical and not so bogged down in legalese that they're just really practical and and good to use you know yeah. jim goldberg wrote a you know the meeting planner's legal handbook some mm-hmm. years ago and and he actually wrote it for a class he was teaching and then he sort of said well i guess i could also sell this to the industry um but you know that's the last i think really practical resource that's been out there so I, that's something that i would like to work on and also people are always asking me if you know for for help and if i have a risk management plan or a crisis management plan they can use and i always say you know you, you it doesn't work that way um you can't just take one off the shelf and fill it out although i know people do it's a process and so i would love to write a book on the process that's so that people can use it to help themselves. So I, those are a couple of things that are on the sort of back burner that I would love to do. I would, I was just, when you were talking about all this, I was thinking, oh, you need to do a podcast. We need to get you doing a podcast <laughs> and then we'll do it as a, um, as chapters basically. And then we'll transcribe it and then you'll have a book. Oh, well, that's an interesting yeah, idea. So we could, we'll talk about that later. Um, I also was an EMT for a long time. I was a fireman. I don't know if you knew that for a long time. I, I, somebody mentioned that you yeah, were a fireman. For a long time. And then I was an EMT, and I, enjoy, I really enjoyed that. So I would Did- recommend it. It's just neat to know. I mean, I haven't done it in a long time. It's been years. But um, yeah. it was nice to have all that um, knowledge. I yeah, still well, have it well, now. And I mean, it, I, and I lived near a river too. Um, we have a place in the Sierras, and people have gotten in problems. And it's funny how it comes back to you. Just all that stuff. It's just great knowledge, too. You know, really, yeah, just well, kind of fun. That's, that's what I sort of thought. You know, I'm I'm always teaching about you know wait until the emergency responders come, and this is what they're going to need to know. But boy, it sure would be nice to actually know what the. I mean, even if I never used it, just to know what the yeah. emergency responders would want to know. And plus, I have this six year old who likes to climb up on the roof and do other dangerous things so <laughs> probably wouldn't be bad to have the skills that's good yeah well kids are like they're unbreakable it seems like so i would it does i'm amazed at how yeah. resilient he is yeah i'm amazed too when i was a fireman the kids we'd come up on like you did what and you're like just talking to me right now <laughs> <laughs> um okay so um are you struggling with anything um you know, personally or professionally, that's something that you'd like to share. I mean, obviously, I know you don't want to share you know, everything, but. Uh. Yeah, well, you know, I think like a lot of people, probably the biggest challenge I'm having right now is time management. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with I think one of the challenges of being a multipreneur, as I call myself, and having so many different things coming in and different types of things is. Yeah, the ebb and flow of work makes it hard sometimes to to manage the projects and the deadlines and and all of that. Um, And also just, you know, managing personal life. My my son uh, has has been wrestling and so, you know, he unexpectedly made it to the the Georgia Kids State Wrestling Championship. Wow, that's great. uh, Well, it was fantastic and he placed fourth actually in state. Wow. Uh, but it was, you know, it was sort of, it was fantastic, but it was also like, oh, boy, do I have a deadline I really need to meet, and now we're going out of town for right. state. But, right. you know, but you do what you have to do as a parent, and, and he placed fourth, and we couldn't be prouder. Of course, he placed fourth in the under 40 pounds category, um, <laughs> but still. <laughs> He's a monster. He is. Wow. He's a brute. I was just I was just thinking we just got two puppies and one of them is a mastiff puppy. We just happen oh, it's a mixture and he is four months old and he weighs fifty pounds. Oh, so you can imagine I was just thinking like when you said the weight under forty, I was thinking, Wow, the dog is gonna be ginormous. Like why did we buy this dog? <laughs> anyway, um anyhow. Um so um <clears throat> excuse me. So let me ask you a few questions about um like yourself and I'm asking this, I'm trying to ask successful people um, you know, questions about stuff they're doing. So maybe people who are listening can pick up some, you know, resources, nuggets, or, you know, little things that they're doing. So, um, and you can skip over any of these questions. So I'm not going to, you know, I sent you a bunch of questions just so you'd be prepared a little bit, but I'm not going to ask you all of them. But like, is there a, a, like a typical day? Do you have any like morning rituals, like a food exercise or like regular reading you might do? So kind of, t- is there any, you know, uh, news sites or, or social media stuff that you always go to? Um, just kind of give us a little little brief what you do uh, in your day. Sure, sure. 
Um, well, I always start the day with a pot of hot tea because I'm not a coffee drinker. Mm-hmm. I had a, a boss a long time ago in my first meeting planning job who saw me drinking a Coke at my desk and said, well, when you grow up, you'll learn to drink coffee. So apparently I've never grown up because I don't like coffee. <laughs> what do you drink? Um, what kind of tea? Do you have a special um, tea you like? I d- I actually um, get a Turkish tea. I was sort of spoiled by a trip to Istanbul. Nice. um, And the wonderful uh, tea that they serve there everywhere. Uh Uh-huh. And um, so I now order it um, from Amazon. I used to have a little Mediterranean deli I could get it at up in D.C. But I order that and then I – but I drink it English style. So my Turkish friends would be quite mortified that I put milk in their Turkish tea. Um, you know my friend Jason Perkins, who I just interviewed a while back. He just went to Turkey, and he said it was fantastic. Oh, it it is. It's a it's a wonderful country, and Istanbul was a just a delightful city. Yeah, so so nice. It was so lovely. nice. Okay, sorry to so, interrupt you. Go ahead. No, nope, that's okay. So I always uh, I always start off with the tea, and uh, then I have to go drop my son off at school, and then I come back and. Um, Take a walk, usually with my husband, around the neighborhood. That's some nice together time that we squeeze in before work really gets going. And um, then when I sit down at my desk, my husband starts shaking his head at me because I'm not a morning person. (laughs) So I can really waste some time in the morning. Uh, My prime time for productivity is in the afternoon between about 1 and 4. So in the morning, I usually read the Skim News. That's I, I subscribe to Skim, um, so I get my email news through that. That's well, about I, all I, I can handle. What, what is that? I've never. You don't know what that is? No. It's a, it's an email uh, news, sort of a newsletter. It's a summary of of news, and it's written written in a very casual millennial kind of style Mm -hmm. so it'll tell you what happened at the debate what happened at the you know primary or whatever but in a really sort of irreverent um conversational kind of style and that's really about no it's an email uh email subscription so you get an an email very cool okay thank you yeah it's uh, s-k-i-m-m um skim and it's i really enjoy that uh, because i don't usually watch the news because it's too depressing right so that's just enough news for me and then i always check my facebook and my twitter um and i tend to re- really kind of putter around until about 10 o'clock in the morning you know i check emails and respond to them and organize my desk and ask my husband questions that he usually doesn't answer because when work Phil is at work in the morning, he's really concentrating and focusing. Because you guys he is are a morning- sharing an office. We share an office. And he uh, he's a morning person. More's the pity. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's a good guy otherwise. So uh, that's usually sort of my morning routine. And then, you know, my husband's a – he's a wonderful man and he's a stickler for schedules unlike me. And so at 10 o'clock, I, he brings me a snack. And at 12 o'clock, he tells me it's lunchtime and he makes us lunch. And at, let's see, 3 o'clock, he goes in and squeezes us some uh, – some vegetable juice, usually beet, kale, ginger, apple, carrots, spinach. So that's wow. sort of my uh, overall skeleton of the day. And then in between all of those things, I, I get work done, hopefully. He sounds like a great guy. I hope my wife does not listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He's fantastic. All my friends are quite jealous. <laughs> all right. So what book is on your Kindle or next to your bed right now? Well, I have a couple. For fun, I'm reading Harry Potter because, strangely, I've never seen the movies and never read the Harry Potter books. Are you liking Uh, them? I am. I am. I'm on the fourth book now. Nice. And and it's, uh, you know, they've they've been really fun to read. And, in fact, I was telling my son about them uh, on one of our drives to school. And so he really wants to see the movies now. So I'm going to use him as as an excuse to, you know, get the movies and watch them. So, yeah, I think that'll be fun. But, no, I really am enjoying those. And then um, for Christmas, my husband bought me the uh, Brene Brown book, Rising Strong. And so I've been re- reading that. Um, uh, uh, one of my former students and a friend and colleague, Nan Devlin, who lives out in, in uh, Portland, had bought me the see, uh, the uh, audio book, um, The Power of Vulnerability, Brene Brown's. And she sent it to me, and you know it's all about. Uh, are you familiar with Brene Brown's no, work? No, I'm not. 
Okay. Well, she she's a uh, so, uh, social worker or a sociologist, a social worker, I guess, a uh, faculty member, researcher. She calls herself a researcher storyteller. And her topics are vulnerability and shame. And so she talks about, especially in that first one, about the power of vulnerability and shame and about basically how, you know, owning our insecurities and, and um, you know, living in our shame and accepting it and all of that actually makes us stronger and, you know, the things we do in reaction to shame. And anyway, so hmm. Nan sends me this audio book and I think there is no way I'm going to listen to a CD set on shame. What I don't, what is Nan thinking? She's crazy. And then I started feeling guilty because I'm like, well, I can't tell Nan I didn't listen to it because that's rude. So I said, oh, grudgingly, all right, I'll listen to it in the car on my way, and I just won't even listen to it, but I'll listen to it, you know. And uh, oh, it was so fantastic, and it was just – it was amazing. I mean, it was just brilliant. And this this woman, Brene Brown, she's she's real, and she's messy, and she's brilliant. So, you know, I just really – I really enjoyed what she said. So I've listened I've I've listened to her first couple of books and then Phil bought me this Rising Strong which is about uh the power of basically getting up after a fall like in a, not a literal fall but a you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. after you've crashed and burned that rising from the ashes kind of thing. So Rising Strong it's basically the recovery um, and so I haven't gotten too far into it, but it's, it's, she tells a lot of personal stories in it so far about times that she was totally vulnerable or totally shamed, you know, sort of hit rock bottom, and then how she grew from that. So it's, it's pretty interesting, um, you know, it's a cool. personal growth kind of thing. Very cool. And so is that a book that you give to others? Do you have a book that you always give to your friends and, or you recommend if someone asks you to go for a book? You know, I my favorite book. I get and it probably again probably shows my age and where I am in life. But the book I find that I have been gifting the most often is a book called "Repacking Your Bags: um, Lighten Your Load for the Rest of Your Life" by um, Leader and Shapiro, and it's kind of a book about. I guess it's kind of a book about midlife crises, but it's sort of about getting to that point in your life when you think, how did I get here? And is this really where I want to be and what I want to be doing? Um, Which I I think people of a certain age (laughs) do get to, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I I found myself sending that to a lot of people because it's about sort of about that reinvention. You know, it's about reinventing yourself and reprioritizing and, you know, really rethinking what's important to you. You know, there's a, a big push for physical minimization, smaller houses, less stuff, decluttering, all of that. But this is about sort of mental decluttering. Um, and it has some great stories in it and it has some just sort of a great approach. So that's probably the one I gift to people the most often. Very cool. Um, do you listen to any podcasts? Are you a podcast person or not? <laughs> I, I, I hate to tell you, I'm not a podcast person. No, that's person. fine. I, I, you know, it's interesting because there are – when I ask people that, either people – when people start listening to them, it seems like they listen to a zillion of them, and, and I'm always interested to hear what people listen to, but that's fine yeah, the, too. That's, the I only mean, one I've really ever listened to is um, – uh, what is it? This American Life? Oh, yeah. Have you listened to Serial? No. You should listen to that one. That's really interesting. The first season of it. They did, they're, yeah. they're in a second season now, but – um, it's a P- NPR one too, like this American Life. But anyway, yeah. I, I, and I'm not pushing it either way. But that's a fun one for like travel to download it, and if you're sitting on the plane to listen to. Um, okay, it's pretty interesting. It's called Serial, not Serial like breakfast cereal, but Serial like a serial murder. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> what do you think of me, Mike? <laughs> Well, I didn't know anything till after this this podcast. Then I'll I'll know exactly <laughs> who you are. Um, so, how about you ever had a nickname? Um, I've had a few, but uh, <laughs> mostly nothing too creative. Uh, my most of my family calls me Ty. Mm-hmm. Uh, my grandmother called me Ty Ty. Uh, my poor unfortunate cousin she called Gay Gay. Um, and uh, I did have some uh, a friend in high school who called me Butch. Huh. Weird. So that was a. Uh, 
that was not my best nickname. No. Was it because you were like Butch Cassidy? Is that why? No, it was more <laughs> because I sort of had anger management issues in oh. high school. Oh, wow. Wow, wow. wow. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I can't you know, see that though, but okay. I was an angsty teenager. How funny! So, are do you have any favorite um, documentaries or movies um, that you'd like to share? Um, you know my my favorite movie of all times, and it's it's never been replaced. I keep there's two actually, um, and they're totally different. But my probably my favorite of all time is a movie called Dream a Little Dream. Uh, it has Jason Robards in it um, hmm. and Corey Hames. Uh, is it Corey Hames? I always get the Corys confused, but I think it's Corey Hames. Um, it's, I don't think it's very well known, but it has just this fantastic soundtrack. And um, it's just, it's a really cool, has a really cool message. And it's about love and, um, and supernatural. Cool. And so I kind of like that. Um, cool. And the other one is The Lost Boys. Did you ever fun. see that? Yeah, yeah, because I, I grew up in the that, you know, my summers Did were all you? in Santa Cruz, so it's that, that whole boardwalk thing, yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was very scary afterwards, like walking around there at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved that movie. I, I still love that movie. It's one of the few movies I own. I don't actually own How too many. funny. That's great. Once I've seen a movie, I'm sort of over it, but The Lost Boys, oh, I just love it. How funny. That's Because, you know, vampires and... Yeah, vampires Can't go are wrong fun. with vampires. Yeah. That's really very funny. Okay. Um, so, do you have any... Let's see. I have so many questions I wanted to ask. Um, do you have a... How about... Have you ever had a really strange experience um, in your speaking engagements? <laughs> a strange experience? Yeah. Uh, uh, I was going to ask, you know, embarrassing or funniest, but maybe the strangest. Do you have a, a good experience that you might want to share? Um, it, well, could the, be, it could be like a war story, too, you could say. Yeah, well, I was going to say the first thing that came to mind was a bad experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, I was, gosh, for some reason I want to say I was down maybe in Mexico, but I, I don't remember exactly what the program was. It may have been in, in Florida. I don't remember. Um, I think it was a CRISM program. But anyway, I uh, was doing a contracts presentation, as I often do, and I was um, – I did, you know, did it. We had a great discussion, you know, really good discussion back and forth about uh, contracts and contract clauses and negotiations and all of that. And I could see a woman um, in the second row getting a little hot and bothered, and she was sort of glaring at me. And I thought, man, I am not reaching her. And in fact, she seems a little annoyed. And um, you know, so I kept trying to draw her in. You know, I was using all my techniques and eye contact and. You know, sort of gesturing at her when I said, if anybody has anything they'd like to share, and she'd just glare at me. And um, <laughs> So as soon as I was done, I mean, as soon as I was done, she hopped up out of her row, and she came right up there, and she said, may I talk to you for a minute? And she sort of dragged me behind the screen. I was a little worried. Um, she was bigger than me, but then most people <laughs> are bigger than me. Um, <laughs> And she proceeded to just let me have it. She was a hotel salesperson, and she, you know, said, you can't tell planners that they should do this, that, and the other because they're going to hear it from you, and then they're going to think that's gospel, and that's exactly what they're going to do, and then they're going to be upset with us if we don't do that, and you shouldn't be out here telling people what they should put in their contracts. And Oh, man, she just went on and on and on. She was very unhappy. So that was that was pretty unpleasant. Oh it's the only time anybody's ever done that. Wow. But yeah, I was I was thinking, wow, you you need to calm down. This is that's know. crazy. So because you know that's what I was hired to do was to tell right. people what to put in their contracts Thanks. and how to negotiate and issues. Um, but you know, it some good came out of it though because it did help me to. Really keep in mind when I'm negotiating to, or when I'm speaking about negotiating, to try to make sure I, I play devil's advocate and mention both sides, right? Um, which can make for a disjointed presentation if I do it too much. But mm-hmm. um, you know, just to, to give it some balance. Well, and we don't. In saying that too, it's like you don't, you can't please everybody, and and if you make a stance on things too, is sometimes a a, a very good thing, you know. Yeah. In, in speaking on these things, actually, know your audience who you want to get to. Um, right. So I got a few final questions for you. 
Okay. Um, what is the best advice you've ever received? Oh, the best advice I've ever received. Um, you know, when I was first, I think it was probably my first professional speaking opportunity. Um, and it was one that John John Foster had been asked to do, and he wasn't able to. And since I worked for him, he said, "Why don't you go do it?" Um, so I was I was not even a lawyer at this point. I was still finishing law school, but I had worked with John for a couple of years, and um, I asked my tax law professor because I was taking tax law at the time. I said, "You know, I'm going to speak to this group, and you know, I, I'm a little nervous. I don't really." I'm not sure I know enough. You know, I don't feel like the expert. I'm certainly not the expert. John is, and he's the one they wanted. And my tax law professor looked at me, and he said, you know what? You only need to know a little bit more than they do. And so I've always thought about that when I'm speaking, you know, especially when I choose a new topic or I'm trying something new or there's a new issue in the industry and – um you know, it's probably not the best advice to share with everybody because, you know, everybody wants to think I'm, I know everything about something um, if you're hiring as a speaker. But sometimes it's just a matter of knowing enough to get the conversation started. Yeah. Um, and so that was really helpful. Um, that's good. To I think me. that's great advice because that's a lot. I think that's the way a lot of people, well, myself included, like I don't, why I don't like to speak at these things is because I always feel like I'm kind of a fraud. But that's nice advice because you don't really need to be the complete expert. Well, and you know, they say, and, and I don't mean to sound sexist here, but they say that, that we women in particular are really bad about this, about feeling like we have to know everything there is to know about something before uh-huh. we can hang our shingle out or or speak on a topic or write on a topic and you know uh, somebody told me this at IMEX last year you know and she 